Hey, I'm Steve Adler. I work for IBM. And what I wanted to talk a little bit to you about today is something a little bit more down to earth than flying in space. Something very down to earth. I want to talk about food and agriculture and agricultural production. Uh, about a year ago, I, I, to be honest, I didn't know anything about NASA or about farming until about a year ago when I joined a program called GODAN, which is the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Program launched by the US Department of Agriculture. And the purpose of the program is to try to inventory agricultural production all over the world for the first time in human history. In the United States, we have really great agricultural information about what food is produced because we have the US Department of Agriculture that collects this data. 20 or 30 other countries do so around the world as well, but the vast majority of other countries don't. And even in the United States, we don't know fully all the food that we produce. It isn't all counted and accounted for. But thanks to NASA, for the first time, we can use satellites to monitor how much food is produced exactly anywhere in the world. There are satellites that are circling the globe that take photos of the planet every four days. And these photos can identify acres of land and the types of crops that are growing in that land using infrared and spectral analysis. And all of this data is available on NASA's website on their open data repository. All this data is available for any of you to take advantage of to identify exactly where in the world, what is being planted, when it was planted, et cetera. It's really pretty cool. For the first time, we can identify exactly how much food we're producing. And this is really critically important because we have 7 billion people on the planet today. And the planet is warming. And soon we'll have 9 billion. And rather than wait for a food, a food emergency, the United States and UK created this GODAN program to begin identifying exactly how much food is being produced, how much uh, nutrition people are getting from the food, and where we're going to have shortfalls in the future before we have a crisis. Now that's the idea of the program. NASA has also just launched a new satellite called SMAP. SMAP reads soil moisture from space. Farmers used to read moisture of sp from, um, from their own farms by setting out um, sensors in the ground. They no longer have to use those sensors or uh, planes that fly overhead or drones that fly around. They can get this data directly for free from NASA. And this, this data tells you exactly what the moisture is of a particular farm. And if you count, if you take the satellite images of what's being planted and then you take a look at what the soil moisture is, you can begin to calculate what the yield might be for that particular farm long before it gets harvested and goes to market. We can monitor drought conditions long before we have droughts. We can monitor, we can predict floods based upon how much groundwater there is, how much water runoff, what the snow caps look like. All this information is being provided by NASA for free to everyone all over the world because these satellites circle the globe. And we can also assist with something called precision agriculture. Do you know what this is? It's a really cool thing. I just learned about it. Precision agriculture uses satellite data to correctly inform farm combines. You know, these big machines. I think I have a photo of this. These big machines. See this guy here? He's filling up these tanks. These tanks contain uh, fertilizer and pesticide. And what they do is they calibrate, which you can see in the photo, on the top are infrared photos and spectral analysis of specific fields. Farmers use this information to calculate exactly how much water and nutrients and pesticides to deliver to specific zones on the ground. That is, they don't think about an entire field as just a huge field that we have to water and throw water at it and throw pesticides at it. They think about a field as a set of microzones. And each zone has specific climatic conditions. And they can measure what those conditions are on a daily basis and use that information to precisely calibrate exactly the right nutrients and pesticides and water to provide to exactly the right plants at exactly the right time. And in parts of the country like California, precision agriculture could save 50% of current water consumption in that state. You know, last year, or just recently last week, the governor announced these big water measures uh, where they're forcing rationing 
among the population, asking people to cut back 25% on their water usage. And that's going to, personal water consumption is only 10% of the total of, of water consumption in California. Agriculture makes up 80% of water consumption. And so using NASA satellite data, which again is this natural resource the government is providing for free, farmers could use that information to dramatically cut back water consumption and maximize resources. And of course, all of this could have a really big impact on human health because we are what we eat. And having a better understanding of exactly what types of pesticides we should be delivering into our foods could minimize the use of pesticides more specifically and cut the contaminants in our food. So all this data is there. It's all free. Its latency is very low, which means it's updated on a regular basis. Sadly, its utilization is also very low. And I'm here today to urge you to think about how to take advantage of this great resource. You know, a lot of people say, oh, we can solve world hunger. You know, it's really actually possible today. For the first time in human history, we can use satellite imagery to identify exactly what is being farmed where. And that is just a remarkable opportunity for you guys. If you want to make a difference on the planet, if you want to make a difference with your work, this is our golden opportunity to do so. So that's what my challenge is to you. Take advantage of this data and increase its utility. Use your genius, your apps, your creative collaboration, and help us change the world. Any questions? Can I ask a quick one first? Yeah. So is the API just particularly uh, burdensome or something on this data portal? Like, why is the utility, why is the usage so low? I think the awareness is very low. Um, so for example, um, there just aren't a lot of people who are fully familiar with the opportunity to do this. And that's why I'm here speaking about it. Um, GoDan, the program that IBM has joined, that the US Department of Agriculture and the UK are running, has 140 partners around the world, but they're mostly either large or small businesses that are participating or non-governmental organizations. And citizens really haven't been engaged yet. And we haven't had a, the opportunity to participate in hackathons like this and raise awareness about the availability of this data and talk about its use. And I think that's true for lots of open data. I, I work with open data at IBM all over the world. And I think it's, you can make this statement not just about open data from NASA, you can make this statement about open data from New York City. Well, maybe the latency for New York City open data isn't quite so low. But the utilization sure is pretty low. And that's a challenge we have everywhere, is that we just aren't really finding creative ways of taking advantage of the data that we're publishing. It's true for NASA as it is for any other locality. I think there was a question over here, right? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. This is eye-opening. I did not know it existed. I'm curious how the private sector can use this data to their benefit and if any companies are using it in the private sector. Many companies are. So, for example, that would be a key. If you were thinking about developing, let's call it um, an app or an information product, a key customer would be the agricultural industry, both domestically and internationally. So big companies like John Deere and Caterpillar, they build these combines that use the the, um, this information to deliver the nutrients, et cetera, into the fields. There's also networking companies that use this information. Precision agriculture has been around for about 15 years, but so far, maybe about 10, 15% of all farms in the United States actually use it. In many countries around the world, it's still on an experimental basis. And I think um, there's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs who could develop better apps, take better advantage of this, of uh, the data. Um, and so I would think about uh, private industry, both companies like mine, IBM, Microsoft, in the IT industry, who build IT solutions that might take advantage of this data, as well as uh, participants in the agricultural industry. Cool. Thank you. Sure. I had just a follow-up question on the, the challenges, and I totally agree with you about the last mile of open data needing more applications, more people working on it. I'm wondering specifically with this data, if you have any ideas or if you've seen anything interesting that will get the information to farmers in a better way. Um, yeah, we actually, it was funny, um, last year I was, uh, my introduction to this whole topic came last year when I participated in the Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, which was this big um, powwow in Washington the president organized for um, 
34 heads of state from across Africa. And uh, we worked together with USDA on an Africa Open Data Jam that we hosted at our IBM offices alongside the Leadership Summit. And we developed an SMS application to using IBM Bluemix, the guys outside. And in like four days, I had a team that developed an app that would send SMS messages to farmers in remote villages and ask them what they had for breakfast. And you know, you may wonder, well, what does it matter? Like, did they have Cheerios or something for breakfast? No. In a lot of um, developing countries, breakfast is not a common meal. Uh, in a lot of developing countries, they only eat one meal a day, and it's probably lunch. Uh, and breakfast isn't a common meal. But if you, if you have a farmer that's eating breakfast, that's an indication of the health of the farm. That's a simple question you can ask to find out how well is that farmer doing. And if he's eating breakfast, if he answers that he ate something for breakfast, that's already an indication that his farm is doing pretty well. So it's sort of an indirect way of surveying. So SMS messaging is one way of delivering some of the information. And that's actually being done. Um, NASA and USDA teamed up with, um, there's a use case, if you check the NASA website, uh, with Rwanda. Rwanda was facing huge runoff uh, from storms. They had over-farmed their country, and they had depleted the natural plants that resist, you know, it's a, it's a mountainous country with lots of ravines, and because they over-farmed it, they had vicious storm runoff that just led to landslides and huge agricultural losses. And so they used NASA satellites um, to map out where they should plant indigenous plants to restore the hillside to prevent the runoff. And they calibrated that data with smartphone apps that they delivered to farmers to help them understand exactly where in their farms they should plant, you know, in the terraced hills, these plants to hold back the water when it rains. And so cell phones in many countries are a primary tool for information dissemination when you're trying to bring this data from up high down to low to a farmer. Yeah. yeah. So if this information, all this data is freely available and it's been underused, why do you think that companies like Skybox or Planet Labs are launching microsatellites to generate the same kind of information? Planet Labs is a, Planet Labs is a brilliant experiment um, and I'm really excited by it. Um, and I think they offer the kind of innovation which the private sector can bring to issues like that. And I think you heard the, the astronauts talking about this earlier, that it isn't just international or um, fully funded national programs that can launch satellites today. With Planet Labs, do you guys know what Planet Labs is? Oh, it's a small company in California that is launching a hundred very small geospatial satellites. And they are like nine feet long. Uh, they cost about $200,000 each um, to make. And so they're very cheap. And they've launched 28 so far and they're planning to launch 100 and they're gonna go in a ring around the Earth. So the NASA satellites, they take a photo of every part of the planet every four days. The Planet Lab satellites will take high-res photos of the entire planet like a photocopier every day. It's like they're gonna photocopy the Earth every day. Um, now the thing that's cool about that is just the frequency of information because we'll be actually be able to see roads being built day by day by day. You know, houses being built day by day by day. Urban sprawl day by day by day. It's fascinating. However, they haven't really figured out their revenue model yet. So <laughs> let's give them a little time to figure that out because they have this kind of funny model where they're, they put this stuff up there talking about it, but no one's really sure yet, gee, why are we gonna pay for Planet Lab data when NASA's giving us nearly the same data at a three day lag for free? So like, I think it's a great idea. I'm just not sure what their model is. For, for revenue. And I, I'm, I think if you ask them, they'll probably tell you, we're not really sure yet either. Sure. Other questions? Yeah. By the way, the NASA data is coming from Landsat? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, like, uh, what kind of data uh, are you extracting? Is there some sort of uh, are you making it smarter or are you adding uh, your own contributions to it or is it just you're just grabbing information? It's just a, it's just a raw data. It's uh, in CSV, Excel uh, okay. files. It's in an open data repository in the NASA site. Check, check out NASA, what is it? Data, is it nasadata.gov or datanasa.gov? I don't remember the exact URL. But uh, all the data is up. 
it, it's, it's all up there. I think, I think that the SMAP, the soil moisture data, is just coming online now. The satellite was just launched, I think, the last few months. I think the data is just coming on stream now, but the Landsat data is available right now. And it's, uh, as it's, it's published as open data, it's downloadable, machine readable, you can just take a copy. Are there security implications to the coverage of the, of the Landsats? Like, is there stuff that other governmental agencies and departments, you know, want to censor out from this or no? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that uh, there's lots of satellite data that you won't see for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, there are images of, of places, you know, you can even find that on Google Maps. If you check out Google Maps, there are certain parts of the map that somehow mysteriously are not available to be seen. Um, and I don't know what the protocol is for that. You know, I suppose if the US government has a carte blanche protocol, no, don't show that. But I'm not sure exactly what, how the Chinese get the same privilege. But are these, small enough, these are small enough areas that food production there is not a significant Right, somehow action. Fiji doesn't have that privilege, but I guess larger countries do. Any other questions? Uh, no? Okay. Great. Great. Thank you so Thanks, much for your time.